can assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. To try and channel it from the of the free and uncorrupted communication. Thank you, Dr. Johnson, for your very kind words of introduction. Dear friends, good evening. Oh. <laughs> I thought there were a few people in the room. Good evening. That's much better. The first attempt was rather lousy. What a wonderful, wonderful privilege and great joy to be back in these parts since 1986. Thank you so very much for inviting me to be part of a series of outstanding people. It's quite daunting to be following in the footsteps of some of the people you have had here. You know, sometimes when you address, come to address meetings such as this one, they, they will sometimes introduce you by saying, well, you know, he doesn't really need to be uh, introduced, he's very well known. Uh, two, two nights ago, we were in Greensboro in, in North Carolina, and uh, the waiter comes. I'm traveling with uh, a, a colleague, Dan Vaughan, uh, and the waiter is an Egyptian, and he says, <clears throat> you have a strange accent. <laughs> Are you American? And then Dan says to him, oh, you know, this is uh, Archbishop Tutu, you know, that kind of voice. Um, <clears throat> and, and this guy looks at me and he says, are you a singer or something? <laughs> which I thought was very good for the soul. <laughs> but thank you so much uh, for your kindness. I wanted to speak about what I have called the reflections of a wounded healer using Henry Nguyen's phrase, thinking back on what happened in our country and coming to the conclusion that truth is the way to reconciliation. Most of the world and indeed, many of us in South Africa, for that matter, believed that we were going to be overwhelmed by the most comprehensive disaster. That there was no doubt at all but that we would be victims of the most awful bloodbath in a ghastly race war. And when bombs were going off on the eve of 
our historic elections and violence seemed to be going to be endemic, it did appear as if those dire predictions were about to be fulfilled. Things had reached such a pitch that when the daily statistics of the toll of victims was, the statistics were, was, were announced and they said five or six or 10 people had been killed, we would actually sigh with relief and say that only five or six or 10 people had been killed. We were, as some of you say, we were rather up a creek. <laughs> you, might, you might know the story of the man who was driving his car uh, up a mountain road when it came to grief. Fortunately for him, he, he was thrown clear. Uh, and managed to cling to a flimsy twig with a sheer drop to the bottom uh, of the, ro the rocks down there and holding on for dear life he said help is there anyone up there and yes my son do you trust me? Yes. <laughs> Let go of the twig. <laughs> and I will catch you before you reach the bottom. Silence. Is there anyone else up there? <laughs> <clears throat> well, there were very many times when we too wanted to cry out, is there anyone else up there? And then the world was amazed on April the 27th, 1994, to see those long lines of South Africans of all races snaking their way to the polling booths. We had won what can only be described as a spectacular victory over the awfulness of apartheid's injustice and oppression. There had been no doubt that that victory would happen someday. For after all, this is a moral universe. There is no way in which injustice and oppression, lies and evil will have the last word. So we never doubted that uh, the victory would happen. Sometimes I used to call out Perhaps sometimes it was sort of whistling in the dark, say this, this is God's world and God is in charge. But there were frequently moments when you wish you could whisper quietly in God's ear, God, we know you are in charge. Why don't you make it slightly more obvious? <laughs> Yes, we won a spectacular victory, but you know what? It is a victory that would not have happened without the remarkable support that we received from the international community. I recall how on a number of occasions I would visit these parts and especially going to college and university campuses. And I'd come maybe April, May, when students ought to have been worrying about exams and grades and degrees. 
And it was fantastic that there were many of them doing nothing of the sort. Um, <laughs> not quite that way. Uh, but it was fantastic. I've not discovered what cockles are, but certainly the cockles of my heart were warmed <laughs> because going round these campuses, there were the students frequently sitting out in the baking sun, demonstrating, staging sit-ins, on our behalf, 10,000 miles away, in order to try to persuade their institutions to divest. And at that time, the Reagan White House was totally opposed to the imposition of economic sanctions against the apartheid regime. And it was the activity of students, not exclusively, but very, very largely, that kind of demonstration by students that in fact changed the moral climate in this country so that your Congress then passed the anti-apartheid legislation and managed to have a veto override as well. So, we owe a debt of gratitude to those who supported us that we can never discharge. And it is, in fact, even 11 years down the line, it is a wonderful, wonderful privilege to be able to return to places such as this, where you say, we used to come round asking for your help, you gave that help, and voila, here we are, free, free. And it is a very, very great privilege to be able to speak and say, and this is one of the few occasions when one can say, I know I speak on behalf of millions without being presumptuous. I know I speak on behalf of millions of my com compatriots when I say a very big thank you to all who were part of this remarkable campaign to overthrow one of the most vicious systems the world has known. Now, you, you, you clapped, and you clapped uh, in a very sort of sedate, nice fashion. Uh, I, I, no, 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 that's, that's not how, that's not how you, you, you clap when you are saying thank you to people who have re helped to remove the shackles from your wrists and from your, from your ankles. Uh, ah, I discovered, I discovered a wonderful thing. I, I have a magic wand. <laughs> when I wave it over people as I shall be doing just now, it, it turns you into Eastern South Africans. Mm. Mm. So I wave my magic wand over you and I say, fellow South Africans, how about giving these Americans a real humdinger of an applause? Eh?
yes. Well, that appears to be sort of histrionics acting. But that's so only for those who have never been unfree. Because when you have been the victim of injustice and oppression, nothing is too much really for you seeking to express what is really ineffable. How can you really know what a mother whose child was killed gruesomely by security forces, how, 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 how do you actually get to, to know how she has felt when she thinks, ah, that death was not in vain because of our friends. We are free today. And sometimes you wish we, we, had, we had very sophisticated surgery that could split us up and open our hearts and, 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 and you could then look and, and, and be able to detect the depth of our heartfelt gratitude. Thank you. Ah, I, for, I nearly forgot. Uh, yes, I've got to wave my wand back and, and you revert to your normal uh, shy selves. Eh? <laughs> The skeptics and cynics said, ah, yes, they have made a remarkable, indeed almost miraculous, transition from repression to freedom and democracy. And they've done so remarkably peacefully. But just wait until a black-led government is in place. Then, as sure as anything, we are going to witness the most ghastly orgy of revenge and retribution for the blacks have suffered much at the hands of the whites and they will surely want to get their own back. Well, mercifully, these prophets of doom were proved to be wrong when the world watched with wonder and awe and they saw the truth and reconciliation commission process unfolding before their very eyes. Instead of the victims of so much unnecessary suffering, paying for the blood of their tormentors, they amazed the world with their magnanimity, their nobility of spirit, in their willingness to forgive those who had inflicted so much suffering on them. There were very many in our country who had called for Nuremberg type trials, but our country had seen a military stalemate. Neither side in the struggle, neither the apartheid government nor the liberation movements had defeated its opponents, whereas the Allies, as we know, defeated the Nazis comprehensively and so could impose so-called victor's justice. We would almost certainly not have had a reasonably peaceful transition had the security forces known they were for the high jump, facing prosecution after the changeover. And our already burdened justice system would have collapsed under the weight of all the cases and we could not have afforded the high cost of litigation. It would have caused much frustration to people as the courts failed to convict most of those charged, since they had shown over the years that they were past masters at concealing incriminating evidence. It would have been bad for the country to be exposed to all the sordid details over a long period of time 
as litigation would normally have been so time consuming. It was a blessing, therefore, that those who negotiated our transition rejected both the Nuremberg as well as the blanket amnesty options. The blanket, blanket amnesty option would have victimized the victims a second time round, saying to them that their experiences were unimportant or even as good as not having happened at all. Our country chose the route of granting amnesty in exchange for the whole truth in a full disclosure of all the relevant facts relating to the offense for which amnesty was being sought. There were those who complained that this granting of amnesty was letting the perpetrators off lightly. Is this in fact so? We know just how difficult it is to say, I am sorry. Those seem to be some of the most difficult words in any language. I find it difficult to utter them even in the privacy of our bedroom to my, to my wife. We can imagine then what it must have meant to the perpetrators to have to confess publicly under the glare of television lights. Frequently the perpetrator had been a respected member of his community. This was the first time often, even for his family, to hear that this apparent paragon of virtue had in fact been a member of a police team that used torture on detainees routinely, or that he was a member of a death squad that assassinated as a matter of course those who were regarded as opponents of the vicious apartheid system. The stigma of such public shame and humiliation is a heavy price to have to pay, and in some instances, shocked spouses ended up divorcing their exposed husbands. But we would, in fact, in this instance, be thinking only in terms of retributive justice, whose raison d'etre is to punish the perpetrator. There is another kind of justice restorative justice, whose chief purpose is not punitive, but as its name implies, restorative healing. It holds as central the essential humanity of the perpetrator, of even the most gruesome atrocity, never giving up on anyone, believing in the essential goodness of all as created in the image of God and that even the worst of us still remains a child of God with the potential to become better, someone to be salvaged, to be rehabilitated, not to be ostracized, but ultimately to be reintegrated into the community. Restorative justice believes that an offense has caused a breach, has disturbed the social equilibrium, which must be restored and the breach healed when the offender and the victim can be reconciled and peace restored. At home, we have something called Botu, Ubuntu. Ubuntu says, a person is a person through other persons. The solitary individual is really a contradiction in terms. I wouldn't know how to walk as a human being. I wouldn't know how to speak, how to think. I wouldn't know to be human. I need 
other human beings to help me to be human. None of us comes fully formed into the world. I need you in all of your giftedness, with all your weaknesses. I need you so that I can be, I can be me in all of my giftedness and my weaknesses. It's actually quite wonderful. You could almost, you could almost see God rubbing God's hands in, in divine self-satisfaction and saying, even if I have to say so, that is pretty smart, eh? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that is pretty, I mean, it is, it is to create, it is to create, <laughs> oh, wonderful. You, 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 you know the lovely story of Adam and Eve. Adam, Adam is sitting in the garden, and, and he's probably having the time of his life. Um, <laughs> enjoying himself, uh, sitting around there with the animals and everything. Uh, and God says, mm -mm, mm -mm, mm -mm. it's not good for this guy to be alone. Mm -mm. <laughs> and, so, and so God says, and so God says, uh, Adam says, yeah. <laughs> How about choosing a mate from, from these, uh, Animals and so God makes the animals pass in front of Adam and say, how, how about this one? Say, nope. Uh, what about this one? Not on your life. Uh, <laughs> and so God puts Adam to sleep and as the story goes, out of Adam's rib produces this delectable creature. Eve and, and Adam awakes and says, wow, <laughs> this is just what the doctor ordered. <laughs> well, it's, it's in fact, yeah, it is a charming story speaking of the fact that we are made for complementarity that none of us can ever be totally self-sufficient. God, God creates me with my gifts, but also with my legs, my weaknesses. And God creates you with your gifts, but also with your weaknesses, so that you and I can complement one another. We are made to live in a, in a delicate network of complementarity, of making up for what is lacking in one another's gifts. And God can say, voila, voila. That is what I have meant you to be. And so Ubuntu, Ubuntu says, when I dehumanize you, whether I like it or not, inexorably, I am dehumanized in that process. For my humanity, is caught up in your humanity. In order to enhance my humanity, I have to work like blazes, as it were, <laughs> to enhance your humanity. And you think, aha, <laughs> it's one of those crazy ideas the church has sometimes, eh? Until you hear something like, do you remember when Steve Biko, the founder of the Black Consciousness Movement in South Africa, was killed by the security police, they tortured him. 
Jimmy Kruger, who was then Minister of Police, making the, the announcement about this death, said something that must send shivers down your spine. For he said, this, this death leaves me cold. And you see, what could have happened to the humanity of anyone who could say about the death of a fellow human being that it left him cold? And then you said, yeah, of course. If you have been involved in a system that has trodden callously underfoot the dignity, the humanity of others, whether you like it or not, in that process, you yourself become dehumanized. I remember, I remember a young man in those awful days, he's no longer young, obviously. Uh, he'd just been in detention and came out and was placed under house arrest, but he, he, he escaped and, and came to see me in Johannesburg. And he said, Father, you know, when these guys are torturing you, you look at them and you say, hey, by the way, these are God's children and they have lost their humanity. And this young man went on to say, they need us, they need us to help them to recover their humanity. And you, you wondered, listening to a young person speak, and that is Ubuntu, Ubuntu, Ubuntu. Ubuntu, which really, in a way, is reflective of God who, who doesn't give up on anyone. Can you imagine someone applying for a job? I want to be the chief of apostles. And in his resume, the interviewing committee is reading his resume. Hey, this guy, this, this guy denied his Lord and Master, not once, three times. Most of us would have said, mm -mm, mm. you don't stand a snowball's chance in hell, man. <laughs> God, God, God's sense of humor is incredible. Who does he choose? He chooses Peter. This vacillating, the rock. Peter, you're the rock. <laughs> imagine, imagine. You are looking, you are looking for an ancestor for the for the one who is going to be the savior of the world. Hmm? Now who in their right mind would go? <laughs> and choose an adulterer. Huh? <laughs> no one, no one, except God. I mean, God chooses David and the Messiah, the savior of the world is called as one of his greatest titles, the son of David. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. You wouldn't, would you? 
have chosen, have chosen as, as the leading evangelist and theologian of, of, the, of the infant church. You wouldn't, you wouldn't go for the guy who persecutes this church and who wants to destroy it. Oh, very sensible. <laughs> but God does. Because God is just incapable of giving up on anyone. Because you see, for God, each one is a masterpiece in the making. Incredible. You know what I mean? I, 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 would, I would sometimes say to, to uh, people, you know, you try to preach about this extraordinary attitude that God has on us. That, uh, that. Can you imagine a mother pushing a pram with her, her beloved in, inside? And someone comes along and says, gee, now that's an ugly baby. Eh? <laughs> Now, it might, in fact, be the case <laughs> that that is an ugly baby, but I would want to have met the mother who would ever say, yeah, no, you're quite right. Mm. <laughs> this, this, <coughs> this, this baby, no, <laughs> is an eyesore. No. <laughs> Every mother that I know thinks that their child is God's gift to the world. And it's true, yeah. <laughs> That's how it is with God. That's how it is with God. How I many you think? There must be those who are beyond the pale. God, been laden? Sure! And then you discover God loves been laden. Who? George Bush? I mean, God loves, God loves him. <laughs> God loves me. God loves you. It's actually, I, I've, I've sometimes maybe half facetiously said, I'm, I'm glad I'm not God. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine having to, have, have to justify the existence Uh, I, I actually didn't know the, some of the extraordinary things that happened during our Truth and Reconciliation Commission. I recall a mother deeply anguished coming and saying, oh, please, 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 can't, can't you find me even just a bone of my, can't you find me even just a bone of my son so that I, I could give that a decent burial? Her son was one of the many who had disappeared abducted, killed and buried secretly. And we couldn't, we couldn't help her. We couldn't, we couldn't ease her anguish. But sometimes we were able to help because those who came to apply for amnesty had to accuse themselves 
and so they would tell of things that we would probably never have been able to get to the bottom of. And, and then we discover that all over South Africa there were many farms that had, that had been secret burial places. That many people who had disappeared were killed and then buried in, in those graves. And we managed with these testimonies to find some of those farms. And I recall on one occasion we managed to open a grave and they exhumed and the family were standing around this grave and they were looking inside at the remains and then a young man, a member of the family, said, ah, yes, this is my brother, this is my brother. I bought him those shoes. And so the positive identification was made and the family experienced what were told is closure and they were able give a burial to the uh, loved ones. A young man, a young man came to the commission. He'd been blinded by police action in his township. He came and he told his story of what happened on that f fateful day. And then and then when he finished, he was still blind. One of the panel asked him, how do you feel now? And a smile broke out over his face and he said, you have given me back my eyes for years now. This commission established by a president universally loved. This commission representing the nation ah, it had vindicated him. Yes, what happened even in the loss of his eyes was a contribution to the struggle. A struggle that had ended so gloriously, successfully. And then an Africana man came, a white Africana. His son, very young son, had been killed in a bomb explosion. The bomb had been placed in a wimpy bar by the African National Congress, the ANC. And you, you thought he was going to come, I mean, consumed by anger and resentment. And he said, I'm not angry. If I am angry, my anger is directed not at the ANC. My anger is directed at, my anger is directed at the apartheid government. And he's speaking of fellow Africaners. And, and then he goes on and he says, the death of my son. I think, I think it has contributed to what we are now enjoying here. And when he finished, I, I said, no wonder, yeah, we have had this extraordinary transition. We have quite, quite, quite remarkable people, such as you. Yeah. It was clear. It became quite clear for us. 
that there could not be a future without forgiveness, that we have so many horrendous examples of what happens when people do not forgive, when an outrage provokes a reprisal, and that provokes a counter reprisal, and it goes on ad infinitum. Isn't that what happens in the Middle East? A suicide bomber, and as sure as anything, the Israeli will retaliate, but as sure as anything, there is going to be another suicide bomber. As sure as anything, there will be a reprisal. As sure as anything, there will be a counter reprisal. And you see, but when are we going to learn that ultimately there is no true peace, no true security that ever came from the barrel of a gun. When will we learn? And, and we saw just a little in South Africa that, yeah, forgiveness is not easy, it's not cheap. It often has to be confrontational. But if you try and say, let bygones be bygones, they somehow never get to be bygones. They have an incredible capacity to return and haunt us. And you know, we all of us have discovered, haven't we, a deep, deep longing, not for conflict. We have a deep, deep longing for being able to live in peace, in harmony. But you see, that was what God intended long ago, that we would live happily together. And you get the lovely story of the Garden of Eden, where there is no bloodshed, not even, not even for religious purposes. Hmm? Every, everybody in the garden is a vegetarian. I mean, <laughs> uh, it, it, that is God's dream for us to live in harmony. And when we say us, not just us human beings, all of God's creation, the trees and the birds, the flowers, the atmosphere, it's God's dream. And you know, <laughs> it's indeed a wonderful, wonderful thing. that you and I admire, no, 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 revere, not the macho, not the aggressive, you could say quite a lot of things about Mother Teresa, macho is not one of them. <laughs> huh? And just look. Just look at the people that we hold in the highest possible regard. A Rosa Parks, a Martin Luther King Jr., a Nelson Mandela, 
อิดได้ละลามะควายควายควาย it is it is it is because they are good and you and I know deep down in in our very vitals we know actually that we are made for goodness that that the evil the wrong the bad those are aberrations that is why we get so upset the norm is the good and you and you and you and i are made huh, they, they they often say we are made by god we are made like god and we are made for god we are almost the ultimate paradox the finite created for the infinite because you see Found, we found, haven't we? Extraordinarily, that we may look for satisfaction in this, that, and the other, and not find it, because you see, we have a God hunger. We are made, we are made, we are made for transcendence. We are made, we are made for goodness. They say. Each one of us has has a God-shaped space in us, and only God can fill that space. Why incredible? What what really quite remarkable things? We are. A great African saint said, "Thou has made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless." Until they find their rest in Thee. Did you did you hear the story of the farmer who, in his backyard, he 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 had a number of chickens, and and uh, there was a strange-looking chicken. I mean, it did the things that other chickens did, pecking away. But you no, know, it, it was a strange-looking chicken. And then, and then, and then, along comes somebody who knows about these things, and says to the farmer, "No, no, no, man, that's no chicken. That's an eagle." And the farmer says, "Baloney." And 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 the, and, the, and, the, and, and this smart man says, "Give it to me," and the farmer gives him this strange-looking chicken. And he takes the strange-looking chicken, and he goes up a, a mountain and waits for the sun to rise. And 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 when the sun rises, he holds up the strange-looking chicken, and he says, facing the rising sun. And the strange-looking chicken stretches out its pinions, shakes itself, and takes off. And it soars and soars, and it flies way away into the distance. God says to us, "Hey, you are no chicken. You are an eagle." Fly, eagle, fly, and God wants us to stretch out our opinions, shake ourselves, and then take off and soar. And we soar, for we are made for goodness. We are made for laughter. We are made for joy. We are made for caring. We are made. We are made for transcendence. We are made for, we are made for compassion and caring, and God says, "Fly, eagle, fly."
Thank you.